Welcome to Principles of International Relations. I'm Hartmut Lenz. In today's lecture, we will do something which I often call like a Tour de France of 1000 years of world history. Obviously, we can't in one lecture look at every detail of the last 1000 years of world history. We wouldn't be able to do this in a whole se semester or actually in many courses in one semester. Um, so this will be a very rough cut kind of uh, overview over the main developments. Some people might even argue it is way too much uh, Eurocentric and kind of from a Western perspective. Uh, but that's not necessarily uh, problematic for the purpose why I'm doing this. And the reason I want to have this kind of um, very rough cut overview of um, world history is to understand the change of power patterns in the international system over time. So how did kind of power blocks build? How did they decline again? What are the reasons that this happened? Like things like um, uh, innovation, technological innovation, but also wars, conflicts, and mismanagement are, have a really important role in this. And so this class will hopefully help us understand the theoretical concepts which we start learning about from the next class in mainly realism, liberalism and constructivism to understand where the, these kind of theoretical concepts take their intuition from and kind of make it more, kind of develop more empirical uh, evaluations or empirical kind of cases um, which we can use in these theoretical contexts afterwards. So I hope you will enjoy this class and um, stay tuned, I will go right into the slides. Thank you! And what I would like to start first with is to think, uh, talk about the aim of uh, today's class again. So I gave you before the big picture um, showing that we are talking about the historic events of on a global scale, looking um, through rough big patterns or big areas of um, specific ways of trading, of, of cooperation, of conflict, etc. But what I really want to, to understand from this is how did the current international system actually evolve? Where does it come from? So to give it a perspective um, in, in the kind of the longer pattern of world history. Uh, I also want to know what impact has war on the rise of power. We will see that several times uh, the, the world changed uh, drastically through wars. But that doesn't mean that it's always uh, the case, that only kind of conflict is, is leading to change. We also see other situations, and um, the end of the, of the Cold War might be, might be a good example for that, but we'll get into this a little bit later. And also, in the last part, I think what we can, what we can highlight as well is when did countries foster cooperation? When do we have cooperation between countries? Um, is there some, are there some patterns, are there some kind of institutional frameworks which, uh, which increase um, the, the likelihood of cooperation or, or decreases for this matter? So another criticism which might come here is that this is a very Eurocentric kind of perspective on world history. And that's quite right. Um, and there's, there's nothing to debate about that um, from, let's say, from an Asian perspective, from a Latin American perspective, from an African perspective, uh, world history will look very different. Um, the reason why I'm using this is, first of all, um, European countries for at least uh, several um, centuries really dominated the world and their action meant that lots that the rest of the world had to respond in some way. Um, so that's one of the reasons. But the other reason is also that you should not use this as, um, as the, the importance uh, in, this, uh, in this lecture is to use it as a feature, as a, as a kind of an example, how, um, how historic events uh, evolve in patterns. So it's not as important uh, to, to, to kind of focus on whether we focus on Europe or, or, or in other parts of the world, but rather it's important to, to see that we have these kind of changes 
um, in in um, in the power structure on a global level, and also changes in the behavior of individual countries. Um, if we kind of look at it in very very broad terms, we can maybe make a distinction between different areas uh, uh, um, in in uh, historic times. And the first one I want to mention here is what is often called the mercantilist era. Um, which is uh, which is basically for the first time we can talk about um, because uh, about a, a global history because for the first time the whole globe was taken into consideration in in decision making so that's the time when when uh, European countries started out to produce colonies um, and also um, where where then, then the, the world became kind of a, um, an entity which, uh, which in the beginning really was kind of focusing from European countries on, in terms of exploitation, but where it became um, a, a, a play ball of, the, uh, of power structures uh, and the big powers and not just um, a rather smaller area like a region, etc. The second part, which I really want to focus on, is the but is often but is often called Pax Britannica, uh, or hundred years of of peace, and that is that shows the domination of one specific empire, and that is the British Empire, um, in becoming so powerful that it there is not much challenge on a global on the global level, and surprisingly, that doesn't necessarily lead to to more exploitation, but rather to a peaceful environment. And I think we can also then kind of reflect um, on this um, later. Then, what what does this tell us about power structures? Does does um, like uh, having uh, one hegemon in Greece um, the uh, conflict or decrease it, or is it? Um, what are the problems with this? Um, and next, and the next period is often called the thirty-year crisis, and that is can really be seen as as, as an uh, um, uh, an area er, era which is which is uh, in between between this uh, this kind of maybe um, strong powerful position of of the of the British Empire towards a conflictual behavior, um, a situation, especially in Europe, but also spreading all over the world um, in terms of um, in terms of the, the First World War and, of course, the Second World War. So these kind of devastating wars really happened at the backdrop and it made, a, made the world again a very different place and changed powers completely. Right after the Second World War, uh, again, the world dropped into a, into a conflictual situation, but in a different way, uh, kind of a completely different power structure again. And that was the start of the Cold War um, with the with this two superpowers, um, the United States and um, and the, the, the Soviet Union, um, leading really kind of um, this conflictual situation on with two major powers, which again kind of changed the international structure completely. After the implosion of the of the Soviet Union, uh, we had something which is often called a post Cold War period, um, which a lot of people anticipated to become a very a more peaceful period. We can question that. We can see that the world become more peaceful after the confrontation between the United States and um, and the, the Soviet Union was over. Is it like what we had in the Pax Britannica, um, uh, or is it the situation quite different? And now, from this on, also at the last stage, I really want to like uh, look look ahead and see what maybe we can expect for the future as well. So stay with me for first the mercantilist um, perspective. So. What time frame are we talking about? Well, roughly, we talk about the end of the medieval times in, in, in Europe from the, 15th, uh, cent uh, from the 16th century to the 18th century. This is a big time frame. And of course, lots of things happen. And we don't, unfortunately, we don't have the, the time to really get into it, uh, which would be really interesting. Actually, there's lots of uh, interesting developments in this time. 
But as I said already before, the world became a more meaningful entity at this time. It became an economic unit. So, um, so European countries saw the rest of the world not as something which is out foreign and outside and, and, and not really relevant, but as an economic unit. And so we had this kind of power struggle between European countries, uh, which tried to become the most important in their domestic or in or not domestic, but in their region, like in Europe, but at the same time tried to use to exploit um, the outside world, um, the rest of the world uh, for their economic gains. So the idea, roughly speaking, was get as much gold, as much valuable, um, valuable assets like, uh, like spices, salt, pepper, uh, anything which was really kind of valuable in a European context, ex um, exploit the, uh, the, 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 the colonies or the areas to the maximum and then become more powerful in the European settings. So the interesting thing here, uh, it, of course, there's like lots of uh, um, moral and, uh, and other um, questions which, which, uh, which we can, which is safe to say that, uh, that European countries acted appalling, appalling in, in the world and uh, abused their powers to, to destroy and destruct um, and, and kind of created suffering, which in, in many parts of the world are still kind of felt now in, in many African countries, this can be felt now in the Middle East. Um, one of the consequences um, of, of the current conflicts is also kind of based in, 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 in colonial powers and British, uh, British empires. And also in, in, in South East Asia and East Asia, we can still see this kind of colonial heritage as a, as a Damocles sword hanging over the country, so to say. So that's definitely true. But in a way, the, at, the, at the time, the concern of these countries were not so much the, the competition with the rest of the world, but the competition within Europe and using the rest of the world as resources. So also, of course, that also means uh, that the world politics was dominated by European politics. So European countries were fighting wars in, 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 over colonies in, in areas far away from their, from their home countries because they wanted to compete in power within Europe. So what was the aim of uh, the European government? And with government, I mean primarily monarchies within uh, at that time period from uh, a European perspective. So they wanted to ensure political and military power. And as I said before, this uh, kind of political and military power should be from, uh, um, should be in competition with other European powers, not necessarily in competition with, uh, with the rest of the world. They wanted to control and access markets um, across the world. So this was really kind of important for them to, uh, to develop these markets in, in different parts of the world because, again, they wanted to ensure power and military, uh, ensure political and military power. So therefore, they needed this access to the market because they were in competition with other European countries. And again, they wanted to establish monopolies of control. So the thing was not really to trade or to kind of develop economic activity in, the, uh, in these regions, but rather to kind of control the regions, control the resources which were important for them, and then kind of use them in the, uh, in the power structure with other European countries. That led, of course, um, to constant conflict between European countries, but also to hardship in the colonies. So Thomas Hobbes once said, wealth is power and power is wealth, um, which kind of shows very much this, uh, this, uh, this period of time uh, where uh, European powers pursued their interests by creating these kind of colon colon colonial empires in order to control more resources, provide, get more wealth, and this wealth meant more power within the European country, uh, context. So 
depending on what, what time frame these countries were, were able um, to build colonies, that also meant how much power they had at certain time periods. So the Spanish and the Portuguese fought heavily over the predominance in the New World and specifically in, um, in the Americas. Um, the British were late uh, arrivals in this way and challenged, uh, uh, challenged um, the, the Spanish uh, from 1580 onwards. Um, there were also 30 years of war between 1618 and 48 uh, between the French, the Dutch and other allies. Um, uh, and this kind of led to, um, uh, um, uh, to a decline of the Spanish at the end. And what we see here at the very end of this is the, what is called the Westphalian peace. Westphalian peace um, uh, kind of acknowledges the, the, the territorial integrity of a country. And that becomes really kind of interesting um, because until now, uh, the idea of a sovereign nation state is really based on this idea of a Westphalian peace. Um, after this period, what we really see is the, the start or the rise of the British Empire and the British hegemony afterwards. So the English and the Dutch fought each other in a series of wars where the English surpassed the Dutch as world's leading trading and maritime power and gradually became more and more important. Then as the next one, uh, the Anglo-French conflict is a long period. So over 150 years of conflict between the English and the and the French and, and um, kind of, and at the end in the seven, seven years war, the British uh, uh, kind of led to a predominance in the region and the French revolution uh, uh, and the, uh, ended the French challenge of, of the Brits in, in this way. So especially then we had a, like a, a continuation of the, the conflict between the Brits and the, and the French in the Napoleonic Wars that was in the beginning of the 20th, uh, 19th century, sorry about the 19th century, 1804 or 19, uh, uh, of, uh, 1815, where uh, the Brits defeated Napoleon and it's the famous uh, uh, um, um, uh, Battle of Waterloo, um, can be um, uh, is, is, is world famous for, for, the, for this event. And uh, we can see also you know, the, the, the victorious uh, uh, Lord Nelson is troning over Trafalgar, uh, Trafalgar Square in order to kind of uh, commemorate um, this very important historic event for the, for the British. By the end of the Napoleonic Wars, uh, a mercantilist uh, area also changed. Why? Um, because the British uh, dominance in Europe also meant that this conflictual situation in Europe also ch uh, changed and become less important. So we had one power which was dominating all the others and uh, this power was the British Empire. So conflictual behavior was not so, so uh, frequent anymore within Europe because the power structure became clearer and clearer. And what happened then afterwards was rather that security in, uh, interests evolved than, uh, um, than the ideas of, uh, um, of, uh, of um, power grab and conflictual behavior within, within Europe. So in a way, the hegemony of one country didn't lead necessarily to, to more conflict, but rather less conflict. And what we can see and what I show in the next slide is that this kind of a hegemonic uh, uh, situation prevailed until a new shift uh, came into place. And that was the Industrial Revolution, uh, which also changed the economic perspective of uh, the, the individual countries completely. So we can roughly say from 1815 to 1914, so a period of 100 years is, of, is called the Pax Britannica. So the, I, uh, the idea here is what I outlined in the, in, this, in the slide before, is that Britain became the predominant power in Europe and also with this, the predominant power in the world. It had the most colonies, it had the biggest resources and it won the, the, the decisive war against, uh, wars against the Dutch, the Spanish and the, uh, and the French. And so in this way, 
they um, they led uh, um, it led to a, to a, a, a prominent or the, the most powerful position in Europe and the most powerful position in the world. However, interestingly, uh, um, the economic model of the British um, after this uh, kind of uh, gaining the dominance change. So it wasn't so much by focused on exploitation anymore, but rather of integration. And we can see this in the, um, in, 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 in the development of, uh, of harbors like, like Singapore, but also in, in, in other areas like, um, like India, where trading restrictions get limit, uh, uh, lowered. So, so interestingly, the Brits actually let other countries participate in their trading in different regions. So it's not that they can, uh, before in mercantilist periods, it was that once the area was under control of one country, other countries were excluded from trading with them. And this my idea was really then the, there's a dominance of one country and it's kind of exploiting that by creating monopolies. This changed afterwards and, uh, and the countries uh, and Britain opened its markets also for competitors like, like France, but it was able, because it was under British control, it was able to define the trading rules. And so it tilted these kind of, uh, kind of rules in, uh, in its favor. So for example, uh, um, a certain fee structure was introduced that, that countries had to pay additional taxes if they wanted to trade in, in, in harbors like, like Singapore or with, with colonies, uh, with British colonies, if they were not uh, British. And so the this kind of created a very interesting dynamic. First of all, the world markets became more integrated. It also didn't deter other countries like the, the French and the, the Spanish and, uh, and the Dutch, etc., from from trading with the British. Uh, actually, it was an in, it was interesting for them, and their economic uh, development also grew. But it was always tilted a little bit into the uh, into the um, direction of the of the bridge, which had more favorite terms and could um, could use this power structure to actually develop more or, 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 or exercise more power than, uh, than, the other uh, than the other countries. So what we had was really this situation that all European countries benefited, but the British benefited over proportionally. So over time, they became more and more powerful. The gap between the other European countries and the Brits grew, and therefore they became more and more untouchable. So in the long run, we would expect that this is actually leading to a long-standing prevalent uh, uh, dominance of this hegemonic power, um, Britain. But of course, we know that it didn't really work in this way. But these kind of hundred years of peace um, it kind of led to a surprising fact. It didn't lead to increased exploitation of the Brits of the rest of the world, but rather kind of to a greater cooperation between European countries, of course, not necessarily between the colonies. The colonies still had a very hard time, were mostly exploited and didn't really have the opportunity to develop well. Um, but we did see within Europe, we see several sources of greater cooperation. In a way, the, the interests also converged because it was not competition of all, over these resources anymore, but rather the focus was on trading. The interests of the, of the European countries became aligned. They wanted to have peace in the, in, in the uh, uh, regions abroad, and they also wanted to, um, to, to have as smooth trading as, uh, as possible. Something like the Concert of Europe uh, was established, which is a system under which majority powers consulted on important diplomatic affairs. Why would they do that if they fought so much before? Well, because now the alignment of their interests actually led um, to much more cooperative behavior. But all of this, of course, stabilized the British uh, hegemonic um, uh, situation and really made the, the Brits, the most important uh, country in, in Europe and therefore in this way also in the world at the time. So in a way, 
by becoming the dominant power, it seemed that Europe became more peaceful. Europe actually, um, actually felt like these massive European uh, wars would be over by the British, uh, and, and also because of these kind of aligned interests and the dominance of the British. However, there was a big disruptor at the end of, of this period, and that was the uh, an arrival of a new power, Germany. So you might ask, like, where has Germany been before? It was always there in the center of Europe, so what's wrong uh, with this? And so you have to know that your, uh, Germany wasn't really a unified country um, until, until the, the, um, the late 19th century. Until then, it was a collection of, uh, of kingdoms which were independently governed, um, also uh, uh, com uh, competing with each other, unified by a language and maybe a common culture as well, but predominantly in competition with each other. So the, 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 uh, the, the German unification or the unification of these, of these kingdoms into one country suddenly kind of gave birth to a new power in the center of Europe, which kind of disrupted the power, the existing quite stable power structure uh, of, the, of the big European countries. Additionally, there were some other trends which existed at that time. The one is that the Ottoman Empire, so the, the Turkish uh, um, uh, Empire, uh, really crumbled for a long time. It kind of slowly, slowly lost power, and this kind of um, this kind of created some vacuum of uh, of power within, especially in in the um, south, south, southeastern part of Europe. Another really kind of um, 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 the, um, um, so so uh, another kind of issue was uh, that uh, that Russia actually kind of uh, sustained uh, restrained uh, uh, the European powers, and Prussia, of course, the one of the biggest kind of uh, um, kingdoms in Europe, led to this German uh, unification and the, the rise of a German. I wouldn't say empire, I'm not sure why they wrote empire here, but uh, a, a German uh, a country which was becoming much more uh, powerful. So, <clears throat> interestingly, at the same time, um, the, the economic model changed a lot as well. So you might want to say like, okay, Germany maybe got re uh, unified in 1871, but it didn't have any colonies. It didn't have any uh, kind of sizable sources of power. So why would it become suddenly relevant within the, in the, in the, cons uh, the, the, um, the perspective of uh, Europe? And the main reason here, uh, therefore, is uh, that there was also a difference uh, in the economic model, and that was the Industrial Revolution. So it started in Britain, of course, but it kind of created a completely new economic model. Before, it was economic wealth was primarily based on the exploitation of resources. And these resources were mostly out of, uh, outside of Europe and dominated by the British Empire. And therefore, we had what we said before, this continual rise of the wealth of the British Empire, which was gradually becoming more, uh, more wealthy and more powerful than all the other European members uh, and neighbors. But the Industrial Revolution created a situation where wealth could be created, created without this kind of territory and within uh, the individual countries. So while it was started in, in Britain, other European countries, of course, also took over this industrial revolution and it provided especially in germany it provided a resource uh, to develop its economic strength without the reliance on external um, uh, sources and uh, uh, interesting things which happened and which actually kind of uh, uh, are relevant until now is that the city of london added increased its influence uh, as a as a um, uh, um, as a kind of basis for 
um, for collecting money and, and using it uh, international hub financial hub at the time already and kind of kind of putting it into into new concepts like like industry uh, uh, industrial revolution and others and this kind of trading hub collecting money from everywhere in the world and kind of funneling it into into development uh, is something which is still existent at the time and a great asset uh, for the Brits even even nowadays. Um, but the trade liberalization, which the British started and which was greatly beneficial for them, also changed the world market. So it was easier to access it. You didn't need to have colonies anymore. And therefore, like um, countries like Germany could also, with kind of producing goods, could also access these markets and, kind of, and, and, and grow in this way. So what we do see is that in the 18th century, suddenly there was a real boom. Uh, of economic activity in the 18th century, uh, advanced countries which uh, which participated in the in the industrial revolution grew uh, two to three times in their economic size. So this shows that it actually has a big impact on uh, on the economic development of countries, uh, and therefore was also possible to destabilize um, existing structures. So this is at the end of the uh, of the what we see like maybe. The, the British Empire, of course, it continued to exist, but maybe that is the heydays of the British Empire. And we can see here already that big parts um, are, of course, um, you know, of the world are split between European powers. We also see Russian Empire, it's, it's a bit um, different than uh, um, because it is a, a continuation of one territory. Um, but um, large part of, of, of Africa, of um, Asia, um, and also in, in, in South America uh, have been kind of colonized and be under the control of um, European powers. This kind of changed, of course, in the, um, at the end, uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. So in a way, this is often called the 30 years of crisis or the two world wars, which was a completely new dimension of conflict, which didn't exist before. We did have lots of uh, periods of wars within Europe, for example, but um, the dimensions of these world wars were really uh, unseen before. Um, it also kind of created things like a eco global economic depression and un uh, uncertainty. So, the first thing was because the power structures changed in the Europe, uh, in Europe, it also meant um, that this kind of um, the diplomatic balance which existed in the in the periods beforehand during the Pax Britannica also kind of uh, collapsed and created new cleavages of conflict. And I will go into this uh, just in a minute. Uh, so, as I said, the the Ottoman uh, Empire, but also the Austrian, Hungarian, and the Russian empires were all kind of weakening over time, which left a little bit of a, um, a power vacuum between different, um, different actors. And in this, within this kind of power vacuum, other actors became more advanced. On the world stage, uh, most, uh, most prominently the US and, and Japan, Within the European country uh, context, uh, it was Germany who kind of gave rise, as I, as I mentioned already before. So we have two kind of different structures. Some of the old empires uh, have been crumbling and struggling to kind of uh, keep up with it. And new ones actually came up, uh, which became more powerful. And that kind of get, get, gave a, a, a shift in the power structure, which worried at the one hand the existing powers, but also kind of created a situation of possible uh, possible opportunities for the for the for the new powers so the first kind of big, or uh, the first world war was the big kind of cut and seizure in in this um uh, in this uh, existing uh, international political order. It was also at the time it was known as the, as the Great War because people could not anticipate that something like this would happen another time and definitely not in the short period of 30 years. But it was a, a, a devastating conflict of unknown uh, consequences. Uh, it killed at least 15 million people 
uh, including 7 million of civilian people. And that's a very new situation as well. While we had lots of wars fought before, the civilian population has not been as involved and, 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 um, and affected by these wars as it has been by the um, First World War, which kind of created also, beside the, the increased loss of life, a huge loss of life, also kind of devastated um, the economic uh, and uh, livelihood of, of uh, civilians as well. It is also very no, uh, important to see that even though the like Germany started this war and uh, and um, um, and got subsequently got defeated in this war as well, but the underlying tensions did not get resolved. So um, there are issues about the the, the Treaty of Versailles, uh, and uh, the general uh, tendency within Europe was to keep Germany kind of after it kind of caused this war. Um, to suppress its uh, development in order to kind of keep the existing stru uh, um, political structure and the power structure. Um, but it did not really work uh, well. And um, uh, it, this kind of conflict, of course, disrupted also the European kind of political structure and diminished greatly the power structure of the European countries on the global stage as well. So if you see the map, um, after the First World War changed considerably, like uh, it led to a collapse of maybe basically the four uh, big empires, the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the French and the, and the, and the United Kingdom, in a way, in, a, in any kind of uh, empire way. Uh, Germany also lost its colonies, although it didn't really have. Uh, have many, many to start with. The Ottoman Empire uh, got reduced to a much smaller territory of Turkey. So it was a huge change within Europe and the European structure and a huge change in the power structure. And this kind of uh, emerge, this kind of uh, reduction of European power led to an emergence of a new power on the, on the scene and that was the United States. Uh, it kind of, it, it, the, the, the First World War, while the, the US was reluctant to actually enter it, uh, when it entered, it showed that it, it, it demonstrated its economic and military predominance. And it came out as, as the, the number one power um, uh, from a, on a global stage, kind of uh, dominating global trading and investment, uh, and also became uh, became one of the biggest lenders in the world. Before it was one of the biggest debtors and kind of lots of uh, debt towards European countries, especially the British, but it became one, uh, it actually became this, this situation flipped and it really led to a, um, uh, to a more, to become the most powerful country. Also, again, the, U the US actually changed uh, the political order by um, thinking about international institutions, something we will talk about later on as well, and something which is, Eikenberry calls it as a, a liberal hegemon. It tried to use its power structure to kind of create international institutions, which then, then would govern Europe, uh, the, the world and would be able to, to um, develop uh, an international structure which is longer uh, persistent. Um, the League of Nations um, didn't really, uh, wasn't really a success. It was the predecessor of the United Nations. It had several flaws and subsequently it was actually kind of rejected by the US Senate, which led um, to, uh, um, to, to its um, not being really, um, uh, really uh, acknowledged as a major force within the world. And, and very quickly became, became irrelevant. But the interesting thing is that the US had already at this stage tried to kind of create a new, a new global structure of mediating conflicts through international organizations. Okay, before I go into the interwar stability, uh, instability, I would like to ask you to make a short break and think about the, the kind of long-term structure that we had from here from the mercantilist European kind of driven global politics over the 
the rise of the British Empire towards the fall of the British Empire and the rise of um, the U US power in this, uh, in this uh, way. Okay, just take a, take a bit of, uh, of a break. I think it's now maybe half time and um, kind of maybe uh, think about these kind of long-term structures and I will kind of continue uh, with the interwar stability after a 10 minute break. Okay, here I am back. Uh, welcome back. Um, I would like to kind of continue with this lecture by talking about the interwar instability. So just to recapitulate, so after the end of the First World War, we had the situation, Europe down, uh, United States becoming more, more uh, dominant. And what we had, uh, if we kind of take again a look at Europe, uh, what we do see is not that this kind of war stabilized uh, uh, the European politics, but rather it kind of made it even more fragile. The political systems in itself were instable, very kind of competition. Uh, new models of governance like, um, um, uh, like, uh, like uh, communism became very, very uh, prominent and lots of intellectuals supported to change the political structures within European countries drastically. But there were also diplomatic tensions between the countries. So while Germany lost the war, it never quite accepted the Treaty of Versailles, which was regulating uh, the end of uh, um, the conflict and regulating how much reparations, etc., cetera, what uh, Germany has to pay. And this kind of created ongoing um, uh, diplomatic tensions um, where France and Germany continued to clash diplomatically and kind of had, had frequent conflicts, um, but there was a general reluctance to change the situation because, because they're worried that another war could, could emerge. Um, the domestic social conditions were also kind of really, really problematic. In Germany, we had extremely high numbers of un uh, uh, unemployment uh, the middle class became bankrupt and uh, this was kind of, especially for countries with a new democratic system like Germany, this was very challenging. And all over uh, Europe, but especially in Germany, uh, right wing movements emerged, um, such as the fascists in, in Italy, but as in Germany, of course, the, the Nazi movement emerged, which was generally kind of created a um, a strong anti uh, uh, anti Semitic tendency, um, but also um, other uh, kind of uh, um, violent uh, forms and, and fascist uh, movement, which became very, very aggressive uh, within domestically, but also within inter uh, European uh, politics. So, this polarization and nationalization, national sentiments inflamed and increased the conflicts even further. So if we kind of think about it economically, this was a really kind of the political movement, the political extremism uh, was on the rise and it was fueled by this kind of uh, economic uncertainty and, and, and big, uh, uh, um, big uh, economic crisis like the global recession from 1929. Um, if you want to look at it, uh, um, uh, um, in, in this way, we do really kind of see that the world's spiraling towards, uh, uh, towards a new conflict because of this kind of increased polarization, increased tensions with right-wing versus left-wing politics, but nationalism, increased militaristic governments, increasing uh, military spending, uh, conflicts left over from the First World War not resolved. All of this led to a situation uh, where in, uh, com uh, combined with this economic insecurity um, led to a, um, to a very strong nationalist and conflictual situation which increased tensions dramatically in this interwar period. And it then got really kind of escalated in the, uh, with the takeover of power of Nazi Germany uh, at this stage already, um, uh, Germany was guarded, uh, was, uh, was leading towards another 
big war within Europe. And some of the criticism about uh, the British and the French was that they really tried to avoid this kind of uh, war to happen and try to accommodate Germany in order to kind of maybe not have uh, this um, such a conflictual situation. Uh, in hindsight, this is often seen as enabling Germany actually to rise to a sufficient level that they could kind of start a second world war and kind of gave also rise um, the tour uh, to, to a totalitarian and, uh, and outright um, uh, and one of the worst, um, uh, worst political systems which, uh, which happened on a, on a global stage. Um, with, of course, which which ended in in the in the Holocaust and the uh, and the, the the killing of uh, more than ten million Jews within Germany as well. But Germany was not alone. Fascist movements came on into uh, and 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 right wing uh, uh, movements came into other other countries as well. Most notably, Italy. Um, but also uh, Japan aimed to increase its, its power and territory and kind of formed this, uh, three countries formed an ally, uh, alliance, and a so-called, often called the Axis at the time. So in a way, uh, this, uh, this um, kind of created an increasing power. And in the, initially in the beginning of the First World War, uh, the Second World War, sorry about the Second World War, also kind of led to great, uh, like, um, the military strategy of, of Germany was, uh, was very, very brutal uh, and uh, un unspeakably inhumane, but successful in the, in the first stages. So, so in a relatively short period of time, uh, most of the European countries fell, um, including France, uh, and uh, Eastern European countries, uh, Northern European countries as well. So in all directions, um, Germany expanded with a very brutal war up and uh, to, towards Russia. And actually also in, within, even in Russia, uh, again, came very far distance until the, 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 the Battle of Stalingrad actually turned its tide in this way. At the almost the same time, Japan attacked America by, by famously Pearl Harbor and kind of gave a real shock um, to this kind of uh, American understanding that they are untouchable from anybody outside um, of their territory. And um, from then on though, the war kind of changed and the United States, Great Britain and the Soviet Union these became major allies uh, in, in fighting, uh, fighting back, and therefore the tide changed, and um, and uh, Germany became came more and more under pressure. So did um, Japan. So in a way, we did have this expansionist um, uh, part of the First, Second World War, and then an alliance between the other parties, which led um, uh, to a. Um, changing the tide, uh, subsequently be, uh, um, Germany and also Japan becoming weaker and uh, losing the, the war at the end. However, it was a devastating war um, um, in which, with a huge amount of, of, of losses on, on all times and a war which, uh, which has had no president before that, even though the first world war was already seen as this kind of terrifying war, it kind of topped this even more. So just to give you some kind of numbers here, 30 million civilians were killed, uh, 110 million people served in armed forces and 25 million were killed. Um, 7 million people were killed in planned genocide and maybe seven to 10 million, I would say, um, in, in, the, in the Holocaust. And most European and Japan was left in ruins. So the countries which were, um, were, were like, especially in Europe, which were that for centuries before the most dominant powers were, were left in a state where they did not, where they were completely ruined, economically ruined, um, the, the livelihoods of, uh, of people were ruined, uh, the cities were ruined, 
uh, so we did have, and, and of course in, in Japan, uh, with this, um, and the, the uh, deployment of, of two nuclear, nuclear bombs was also uh, lying in ruins as well. So we had like, at the end of the war was built on complete destruction of, uh, of uh, several advanced countries. So now we can see like what kind of impact did this have on international politics? Um, so in a way, this war, unlike the First World War, really changed the power structure completely. Um, uh, international European countries suddenly became much less uh, significant um, until maybe almost insif uh, insignificant in, in the global, from the global perspective as well. The two rising powers were really um, the Soviet Union and the United States. Uh, but also at the same time, uh, the United States again made a second effort to establish uh, um, international organizations like the United Nations in order to kind of mediate uh, conflict peacefully. So you can see this in two perspectives. On one hand, this is seen as a necessity to avoid any kind of global wars like the, like the Second World War again, and that the, the aim was really to never have these kind of wars again. But it also established this international liberal order where the US um, was in charge of kind of creating, creating this order, but at the same time, let competitors like the Soviet Union and later like China and others participate in shaping this order. That's why it is called liberal because it's not based on pure dominance, but it is based on um, participation with a little twist, so to say. I will explain this a bit more in the thing. So we do have these two kind of superpowers, which um, uh, the Soviet Union and the United States, which then kind of also had very different um, political systems. So Western capitalism versus communism or socialism in the East. And this kind of, at the end of the Second World War, we saw already the emergence of the new cleavage uh, between these two superpowers. So it was like one conflict ended and another one immediately started. So even during the, uh, during the war, we do have a correspondence between uh, um, uh, between Roosevelt and uh, and Churchill, where the British and the and the American uh, the American president and the and the British Prime Minister were discussing um, how to deal with a new confrontational situation after the end of the Second World War. We have to re remind ourselves that this actually means like that at that time the Soviet Union was uh, was in still in. Uh, in conflict with, uh, um, was it still in cooperation in an alliance with the United States and Britain in order to fight Germany and Japan. So we do have uh, one conflict transitioning immediately in another conflict. So what we really have then is the emergence of these kind of two superpowers, which are uh, like, we have the end of the, of the Second World War, and then we have this emergence of the two superpowers, uh, the United States and the Soviet Union. So in a way, the United States um, kind of drew together a new alliance, including the defeated Axis nations. And that's quite remarkable. So in a way, uh, the United States did not um, kind of followed or the United States and the other uh, Western European countries, Britain and even France, which suffered horribly during the Second World War from Germany, but they did not kind of pursue the same way of, um, conf uh, of uh, after war um, um, uh, actions like after the First World War, where the, the Treaty of Versailles was all kind of aimed for towards reparation. So the idea that actually Germany has to pay back all the damages or some of the damages at least, which it caused in the, in the world. But rather after the Second World War, um, uh, uh, Germany was drawn right into the, into the, um, into the era of uh, the, the, the Western hemisphere and was kind of built up uh, with 
um, with the um, um, economically and was was um, kind of the, the the United States and the European countries tried to include it uh, in the in the in the concert of of the, the international cooperation between them, which actually led to things like. Um, the NATO alliance built up, but also led um, to the start of the European coal and steel community and uh, subsequently the start of the European Union. So very different approach towards um, Germany as the, as the, the um, who started the Second World War by rather kind of including it and kind of controlling it by including it into the into the European context, but also in terms of Japan, um, not asking for reparations, rather kind of building up the, uh, the, the country and, um, and providing security guarantees and also uh, economically supporting it to kind of uh, to, uh, to support its recovery. So these Axis nations became subsequently uh, Western allies, which became also, of course, then in the um, in the power struggle against the new kind of conflictual party. And there was um, a conflict in between the US and the Soviet Union. The, United, uh, the Soviet Union did very similar things uh, from its side, kind of it led the communist alliance. Also, Eastern, Euro Eastern Germany was kind of dealt almost similarly from the Soviet perspective uh, than, than uh, West Germany from uh, from the, the U.S. perspective, um, there were some reparations to be paid um, to to the Soviet Union, but all in limitation. And also, economic recovery in Eastern Euro uh, Germany also started quickly. And it's maybe it's it's less known that actually within the Eastern Bloc, West Germany was quite one of the of the the uh, pre predominant uh, economic resources as well. The Warsaw Pact, of course, that the Soviet Union was also kind of the formal alliance and military alliance um, against, uh, against the West, which, was, which can be seen as a counter of the NATO um, from, from, from the Eastern Bloc. So the Cold War then kind of really got into a swing and the conflictual situation became uh, more and more, uh, um, uh, more and more strong or stronger. Um, one of the, the, there were many highlights, which I don't necessarily can go into it, but we, we, one thing which we saw was, of course, the split of Germany uh, into, into two different countries, West Germany and East Germany, um, which were, uh, the, um, and including the building up of the, of the Berlin Wall, etc. So there was a, Germany was still a contested, uh, territory, but rather in the conflict between these two superpowers, not in, in, in a conflict in its own right. Um, which we also said that, that uh, there was a massive uh, arms race between these two parties and the development of nuclear weapons in the Soviet Union and in the United States led to a completely new form of, of military power, um, which kind of um, uh, led to the situation that a, a full-blown war between those two countries would lead to a destruction of the whole globe and every kind of the, all life on, on Earth and therefore um, wasn't really a kind of an option. In a way, there are some scholars which say like, well, the nuclear deterrence, so the, the threat through nuclear weapons led to the Cold War not to become a real hot war because that was actually the kind of, this deterrence worked and can, both countries, both superpowers were too afraid to fight a war because this might lead to, to complete destruction. That is maybe true and there is some kind of nuclear deterrence theory is kind of, uh, as some kind of plausible uh, arguments. Having said that, we have to see that there is, of course, it doesn't seem like a very good, good idea to, um, uh, to uh, provide uh, nuclear deterrence doesn't seem like a good uh, good idea to keep um, uh, uh, to keep peace. Why? Because um, if it goes wrong, uh, we have actually a destruction of of the world, and that would uh, of course be a devastating outcome. So even if the percentage is very low that this will happen, 
it's uh, a very, very risky strategy and probably not advisable. But we also saw uh, um, is that each superpower really tried to use its military strengths to preserve its own and extend its own influence. So what we do have is lots of proxy wars. Uh, so we just have to think about the Korean War, the Vietnam War, several of the civil wars in, um, in, uh, in Latin America, Cuba, uh, et cetera, which all, uh, which all led to a situation that the superpowers were competing over alliances and territory away from their own countries. And this kind of, this, often, this situation is often called proxy wars. That means like countries don't fight in their own territory, a full war between the countries, but rather fight over ideas in other countries, which led in, in countries like Korea. Of course, um, the conflict is not resolved until now. We do have a North Korea and a South Korea and uh, conflictual situations are still existing and actually very relevant at the time. Um, we also had this, this devastating war in Vietnam, which, uh, which uh, destroyed big parts of uh, the population and, and uh, the environment. And um, so we do have a conflict uh, during the Cold War. We do have also a loss of lives and uh, military action, but we did, did not have a war between the two superpowers in itself. So then, of course, we could see like how did this um, this end, this Cold War end? And the interesting part here is that it's not did not end by um, by a conflict as we had the British Empire to end, but rather by an implosion of one of the superpowers. In this case, the Soviet Union, uh, economically it wasn't viable anymore. And domestically, there was so much pressure in the political systems that led um, to, to, to protests, ongoing protests, and I would say thankfully also to some action of uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, not necessarily to a violent um, implosion of the, uh, of the system, but rather to a peaceful one. So, um, I think that's really important to notice because we can see that a system change can happen through conflict, through war, um, often caused by kind of change in the environment, but it can also change um, through other political developments, like an implosion with the Soviet Union. And therefore, we have a completely different uh, political st uh, structure afterwards. If we now look at this kind of post-Cold War period, Lots of uh, uh, people at the time were really thinking, okay, now we have one superpower left, the United States, and therefore it should become the new hegemon. It should, um, it should dominate the world and lead to a more peaceful environment like we had in the Pax Britannica, for example. Um, and in a way, there is some, we, we can see that there are some truths to it. So, um, which we, what we do have is overall, um, there are less wars fought on a from a global perspective than there were 30 years ago. Um, there's also less, uh, less formal wars. There's also less loss of life in military action, et cetera, uh, which, is a, uh, which is a very good result. Having said that, it didn't lead necessarily to this kind of peaceful and secure environment we expected. Why? There were big crises still came up, the crisis on the Persian Gulf, the Iraq wars, um, but also lots of civil wars and conflict uh, like, um, like uh, uh, terrorism became more and more important. Also in terms of the, um, the international structure, uh, uh, we have really kind of a, a mixed, uh, mixed matches. The, on the one hand, the United Nations became much more uh, um, uh, became much more involved in lots of uh, uh, in lots of parts like um, the uh, the sustainable development goals, etc. It became involved in developing uh, the world. On the other hand, what we see in this period as well, and probably up to now, is that power politics, traditional power politics, become much more much more important. 
And conflictual behavior exists and nationalism is on the rise as well. So we can see uh, maybe um, what, uh, whether, what will shape the future and uh, in international politics. And of course, this is like looking into a crystal ball. We don't know uh, what, uh, what will come. But we can kind of see some facts in order to kind of guide us into seeing where, where things might head to. Um, we, we can question whether there's a greater involvement of international institutions in world politics. We do see that in the, gradually international institutions become more important and more, more also active. However, if we have crisis like in the COVID-19 pandemic, we do see the limitations. Very often they're not in the driving seat and the driving forces for, for cooperation, but rather are kind of when situations become very critical, um, countries are uh, relying on national policies and um, uh, in, in order to tackle these crises. So we have on the international institutions, we have a mixed picture, but overall we could maybe see that there is some rise in their, in their strengths. Until now, we also see that there's an unchallenged uh, military superiority of, of the United States, which isn't be questioned. Even rising powers like China are not a military match uh, for the United States at the moment. Uh, another really important military power is still uh, Russia as the predecessor of uh, the successor of, um, of um, the Soviet Union. So, um, so it does have a, a very sizable nuclear arsenal and it should not be underrated in terms of its uh, military power um, as well. Um, but it is it seems without doubt that at the moment, the United States is by far the strongest actor. But we do see that um, uh, we do see a new major conflict on the horizon. And this is the conflictual situation between the United States and China. Um, so uh, the real question about the future is how does the United States deal with the rise of China, but also how will China act within this environment um, of becoming more powerful on a, on a global stage? Will it become, try to push into the direction of its authoritarian uh, uh, regime, kind of using its power actively on a global stage by, by influencing, um, uh, influencing smaller countries which is, or, or even bigger countries? Uh, with its economic power and, uh, and, uh, and threats and promises, so to say, or will it become more liberal and trying to kind of include, uh, be more inclusive, be more open for, for uh, change. And the, the recent trade war between the United States and China and the in increased escalation of conflict between the countries does not necessarily show this. It seems like there is a rather then a more harmonious behavior of both actors. It be, seems that both actors become more conflictual, uh, more uh, assertive in pushing their own interests, which might lead us to, in, in, to a period where nationalistic uh, perspectives become dominant again. So that is something which we, which we can't say yet, which we have to observe. Um, in the future, but it's definitely a cleavage, which is interesting to observe. Um, there are also something which we've seen since the end of the, of the Cold War, increasingly some ethno-religious tensions. So we do see, um, at the one hand, uh, with, the, uh, with increased terrorism and, and uh, um, um, in, the, in, in Western countries, but also in kind of uh, conflicts in the Middle East, we have seen that religion plays a stronger and stronger role in international politics. But it's not only limited um, towards uh, this specific uh, area, but also religious tendency, uh, cleavage has become more prominent in countries like India, uh, in countries which are secular, uh, predominantly secular like Turkey. Um, and and so overall, uh, religion becomes another defining uh, dimension, which hasn't been as important. And it's in, it will be interesting to see 
how this will be, um, will, uh, what happens there in the future. So I think this concludes my, my kind of uh, tour on global uh, history for the last uh, roughly five centuries. Please excuse the, 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 these really rough cut um, um, pictures I wanted to, uh, I made here. The real idea is just to give you an overview um, which can be a basis for our understanding of the rise and the fall of empires and the rise of the fall of powers from a global perspective. Next class we will talk about, uh, we will take a, a step back and trying to use this information which we had here and also other information we have in order to theorize uh, political behavior in an international system. And we will start with this um, one of the, of the oldest and still kind of important uh, but heavily criticized theory of calling realist theory. So until then, I look forward to seeing you in class and have a great day. Take care. That hummingbird never sings Cause I'm the one that's rambling I knew that you'd be